Welcome to the Minnesota WIC Participant-Centered Webinar Series. My name is Karen. I'll be facilitating the webinar today. So during this webinar series, we've been sharing ideas and best practices for providing participant-centered WIC services. My colleague Marcus will be doing the behind-the-scenes work today of monitoring the phone lines and making sure that things go smoothly. The topic for today is handling sensitive topics in counseling. And this is an important topic for nutrition counselors. Often areas around nutrition, health, eating, weight, health habits, they have the potential for being sensitive topics for our participants. So first, we will look at what are the sensitive topics and what makes them sensitive to talk about. Then we'll discuss ways to ask about sensitive topics during the assessment process. We'll also cover strategies for sharing information about sensitive topics effectively. Many topics can be sensitive. We sent out a survey before this webinar asking about sensitive topics. And here are, what, here are some of the common themes that came up when we asked, what are those topics that are likely to be sensitive? Weight issues, underweight, overweight, high maternal weight gain, improper feeding practices. Those could be cereal in the bottle, candy, soda. Maybe a parent doesn't like vegetables, so they don't serve them to their children. Late weaning, failure to thrive, substance abuse, drugs or alcohol, smoking. Mental health issues, postpartum depression vaccinations, behavioral delays or issues, food insecurity, breastfeeding issues. There could be many here. Maybe it's discussing someone's choice prior to pregnancy. Or maybe it's talking about why breastfeeding didn't work out for someone. Both of those were mentioned. Or maybe it's the person who is breastfeeding but requests that full formula package. That conversation could be sensitive domestic violence. So there's many issues beyond food and the nutrients in food that impact someone's overall nutrition status and their overall health. And because of this, we want to find successful ways to ask about these sensitive topics or address them in our counseling. So what makes a topic sensitive? It could be a few things here. A topic could be sensitive because where anxious to talk about it. We have anxiety. Maybe we don't feel comfortable as a nutritionist talking about a particular topic. Maybe it's because we don't have experience with that particular topic. Or maybe it's because we do have experience with that topic in our life and it's a sensitive area for us. A topic could be sensitive because of the participant's anxiety to talk about certain topics. Another reason why it might be sensitive is because we fear that discussing the topic might build resistance in that participant, and that could jeopardize our relationship and our rapport with them. So several reasons why a topic could be sensitive. Here are some of the emotions that might be present during conversations about sensitive topics. Embarrassment, that could be yours or theirs. They might fear judgment. Or during the conversation on a particular topic, they might actually feel judged. They might have anxiety because it's a topic they don't normally talk about with other people. There might be feelings of shame or guilt around certain topics or habits, and it makes it sensitive for them to discuss it. So this slide is titled, Emotions, They Happen. If you work for WIC, you will experience emotions. People might be sad, mad, happy. Lots of different emotions can come up. And sometimes being faced with emotion can be sensitive. You might think, how should I respond? So why is WIC a place where more emotions may come up, perhaps, than other places? Well, there could be a few reasons for this. For one, at WIC we do ask about sensitive topics that might often bring up emotions in people. Another reason is that our participants are often experiencing a time of rapid change or transition and growth. Being pregnant, 
having a baby, raising small children. These are times of transition. There might be a lot of questions or insecurities. There's no defining manual or set of rules on parenting. Also, we often see participants during times when hormone balances are shifting dramatically during and after pregnancy. And these shifting hormones can cause large emotional shifts. With our participants, there might be issues of isolation or lack of support. We might be the health professional they have the most consistent interaction with, and so they trust us more. And they let their walls come down. So potential reasons. You never know when emotions will occur. I remember when I was in a WIC agency doing an assessment, and I was in a postpartum session. And the counselor asked, how are you doing? And the participant responded, most days are good. And the counselor said, what makes a day good? And with that, the participant just started to cry. She opened up. So we can just be ready. We could have Kleenex on our desk or in our drawer. We could let the emotion just be, knowing that it needs to happen and being OK with that. For some of us, this can be a little challenging. If you came from a family background that didn't show much emotion, this could take some getting used to. One thing we can get better at or cultivate is noticing the signs of emotion that might often be subtle. Crying isn't subtle, but other signs of emotion might be. It could be a shifting in the chair, looking away, avoiding eye contact, or maybe they get suddenly quiet. Because we want to listen for those signs and look for those signs and use them to guide us. That woman I was talking about earlier, it turns out what she needed wasn't a whole lot of facts, advice, information sharing. What she needed most was support and a listening ear. And the counselor did an amazing job at listening to her signs and not overwhelming her with too much. And they had an amazing productive appointment. Now I want to share some of your suggestions for asking about sensitive topics during the assessment process. We asked for your suggestions on the survey, and we received so many great ideas. So here are the major themes that came out from the survey, and we'll talk about each one independently using open-ended questions, normalizing, practicing non-judgment, asking permission, allowing for transparency, and providing a range. First, open-ended questions. When we're asking assessment questions, it's often a best practice to save potentially sensitive topics for later in the assessment process. When a person's feeling more comfortable, you establish rapport and some trust, and it makes it easier for the person to share. So here are some of your thoughts on using open-ended questions to ask about sensitive topics. Be open about sensitive topics. Spend more time listening to the client rather than educating them. Use open-ended questions to get them talking about their thoughts, feelings, and beliefs on the issue. Open questions asking what they think about their child or their own weight or nutrition. Ask how they feel about the topic. Ask what their doctor has said. Do you have any concerns about? Or has the doctor had any concerns about? Or what do you, thoughts do you have about weaning from the bottle? So in normalizing, this is a technique. It was suggested by many of you. And it can be a powerful tool with sensitive information. What normalizing does is help assure people that they're not alone, that others feel the same way. With normalizing during the assessment process, what we're doing is letting them know that other families feel or think a certain way or have questions and ask if they have the same questions or ask if they feel similarly. It makes people feel more comfortable to share if they realize that other people have concerns that are similar to them. 
Here are some comments from the survey. I say, some parents worry about and, and give a concern that the client has not brought up. How do you feel about that? Have you ever thought about that? Telling them that we often ask families with these struggles and ask if they struggle in one of these areas. More in a generic sense, like this is something we always ask and areas we like to help with. So this reassurance that we always ask this and these are areas where we like to help people, one thing this does is it makes people think she's not, she's not calling me out, she's not signaling me out. She's asking, she asks others this too and she wants to help. Here are some potential examples of assessment questions that use the normalizing technique. Pregnancy is a time when some women have sad or anxious thoughts. Has this been an issue for you? Some parents feel frustrated when it comes to getting children to be more active and watch less TV. Have you ever felt like that? Some women experience physical or verbal abuse in their homes by family members boyfriends or spouses, and we help them with resources. Do you have any problems with this? So letting them know if they do have issues, they won't be the first. There are others and they're not alone. And this might give them the confidence to share. Several people on the survey talk about making the assessment process a judgment-free zone. We're not asking assessment questions to catch people in the act of doing something wrong. So here are some comments from the survey. Be straightforward, non-judgmental. Ask open-ended questions in a non-judgmental way. Ask it matter-of-factly. Frame it as a standard question. Use non-judgmental language. So we don't need to ask, you don't smoke, do you? Putting a judgment on it. With the assessment, we're getting the big picture or identifying motivations around adopting positive health behaviors. And this is another reason why we might not want to correct during the assessment process or offer recommendations right during the assessment piece in most cases, because it might make someone feel judged for their actions. That doesn't mean you won't probe or ask additional questions to assess if there is energy or if there is motivation there. That's Still assessment, perfectly valid if done in a non-judgmental way. And we've talked about how to ask questions about motivations in a way that won't build resistance in a previous webinar. Another great tool that we often talk about is asking permission. Asking permission gives that autonomy to the participant. They're in control. We can ask permission when sharing information, but we can also use it during the assessment process as well. Here are a couple examples where you could ask permission before sensitive topics. Is it OK if I ask you some questions about your feelings around your weight and eating habits? Would it be all right with you if I asked you some questions about your alcohol use? You could even ask permission to set the stage for the entire assessment process to help explain the process, get buy-in, reduce any anxiety. So you could say something like, during the first part of this session, I'll ask you several questions about her health, her eating, and her activity. And this helps me get a big picture of how she's doing and identify any areas where you might wish things were different or topics you want more information about. Does that sound all right? And getting that buy-in. Transparency in assessment means we're upfront and we explain the purpose of our questions why we're asking a sensitive question. What's the relevance of the question? When people know why we're asking these potentially very personal questions, it can reduce any suspicion that they have or fear that they'll be judged. And this is something I've seen in people's faces when we don't explain why we're asking the question. They might look confused or wary. And their look might say, I, I came here for some help with food and shopping, and why is she asking me these questions about my personal life? So this transparency will help clarify our motive 
and get more open and truthful responses, which will allow us to help people more effectively. Here are some responses from the survey about transparency. Asking permission first and telling them the reason why you're asking for the information, asking for their thoughts and feelings about it first, asking for feedback about the information you share. Inform them what you'll be doing first and why before you ask the questions. And here's another one. Remember why we ask. Use this with clients if needed. For example, we screen for alcohol and drug use because we have resources to help women who are struggling with addiction. Or, this is a safe place to discuss concerns like these, substance abuse, intimate partner violence. Look is here to help and support you if you struggle with these issues. So I think I'd be more open to share my challenges if it were phrased like that. If we're asking questions about these topics, about substance abuse, addiction, smoking, and domestic violence, and we need to make sure that we're ready when a person does disclose. We need to make sure we have our resources, our referrals available, who to call. We know that with domestic violence, substance abuse, depression, all these issues can impact nutrition and health status of women and families. But most of us aren't experts in these topics. We know about nutrition. So for these areas, we need help. We need referrals, a hotline to call, a brochure, or both. Maybe you have someone within your agency or another agency that specializes and can offer support for you a counselor, a case manager, a social worker. You can ask yourself, are you clear on the protocols in your office when someone says, I need help? And if you're not, then ask what those are. When I worked at WIC, I had a person in my larger agency who specialized in domestic violence. She was a counselor at the health center, and I didn't find that out until well into my WIC career. And I, then I realized I could call her or refer to her if necessary. So finding out about your available resources will give you those options. With sensitive issues, sometimes we might not feel comfortable asking a direct question. We might soften it a little. But in doing so, we might make it less likely that people will open up and disclose. As an example, the question, is everything OK at home? It's not a direct enough question to ask about domestic violence. It might be a nice question to ask, is everything OK at home, but not if your intent is to screen for the potential of domestic violence. And we know that one in five women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime, so it's important to address with our population. But being more specific is more likely to get a truthful answer. So some direct screening questions could be, have you ever been hit, kicked, punched, or otherwise hurt by someone in the past year? Or do you feel safe in your current relationship? Or do you feel afraid in your current relationship? Whatever question you use. Another example of being direct in the assessment process, instead of asking, do you have a good support system, a better question might be, who do, who do you have in your support system? So asking for specifics. And this being direct and asking what you mean can help. Another way to encourage honest responses is to offer a range of different levels on the behavioral spectrum and let the participants feel safe to disclose anywhere in that range. So some examples could be, some people smoke a few cigarettes a day, and some smoke several packs a day. What's your smoking like? Or some women exercise very rarely, and others exercise almost every day. What's your level of activity like, typically? This allows people to disclose a response that's anywhere on that range. All right, I'd like to stop here and do a poll. So we asked about those sensitive topics on the survey, and one that came up a lot was postpartum depression. So I'd like to offer a few potential assessment approaches for postpartum depression, and we can vote on our favorite. So I'll go to the poll now. 
I will read the different responses and then we can vote. So how would you ask a question about postpartum depression? After birth, with changes in hormones, some women experience emotional shifts. Some women might be a little emotional, while other women experience stronger emotions of depression and hopelessness. How has your mood been since the birth? Or, if with we asked about signs of postpartum depression, because many women experience this after birth with changes in hormones, and we want to make ensure that women have people to talk with and the resources and the information they need to help them during this time. Have you had any depression or sadness after the baby? Or, after birth, many women experience strong emotions, and often there can be depression. Have you had experience with this? Or maybe there's another that you like better. So go ahead and vote now, or if you'd like to put another response in the chat box, please do so. It looks like the first response has the most votes for it. So using finding what feels comfortable for you for asking about postpartum depression. And in that one, that uses the range in that first one. So some women are just a little emotional, others have more depression and hopelessness. So giving that range and letting them say anywhere on that range. I'm going to go back to sharing. And now we'll shift and we'll talk about sharing information on potentially sensitive topics. So after the assessment process. And this might often mean sharing information or concern when it hasn't been brought up by the participant. That you sometimes what makes it sensitive. The first question we need to ask ourselves is when information needs to be shared and when it doesn't. And this could be different for every person. It could depend on a lot of things, like the person's stage of change, their knowledge about the topic, their interest in the topic, their level of resistance. It's very subjective. There's not a black and white answer. Maybe the participant isn't concerned, but you'd like to share a concern with that participant. Or maybe you'd like to address what you feel is a knowledge gap. They don't have the information. So the question becomes, how can you go about sharing this information or this concern with the participant and still stay within that guiding style of PCS? Someone on the survey said, almost any topic, such as weaning, scheduled meals, water between meals, can be sensitive if the parent is resistant to change in that area. And that is so true. And so here's some comments from the survey about challenging situations. Parent who doesn't want advice or want to change based on what other people think, including WIC staff and doctors. Parents that are disengaged, not interested, or hostile to any input or questions about the sensitive topic. When parents say child is fine and the parents are overweight too. When a parent shuts down about a topic or doesn't seem concerned. So in our line of work, no matter what, there will always be people who don't want to change or don't feel the need to change. And we talked a lot in the resistance webinar that resistance often arises when people feel pushed to change when they're not ready. We talked about in the webinar that there could be several reasons why people aren't ready to enter into these conversations. We have to be aware when we find ourselves wanting to change other people, wanting to fix the situation, wanting to persuade them to change. That's the writing reflex, and most of us have it. And for most of us, that instinct to help, to fix, to convince, that writing reflex, it's not something that we can just easily master and never have to deal with again. It will come up from time to time. And resisting that writing reflex can be an ongoing issue. We might find ourselves falling into that reflex. And when we do, the best thing we can do is notice it happening, forgive ourselves immediately, and then shift our focus of the conversation. There's nothing wrong with us wanting and hoping for positive behavior change, but we can't let that impact our practice of participant-centered counseling and that guiding style of PCS. One person on the survey wrote, don't give suggestions if they're not open to suggestions. That's resisting the writing reflex. Even though we want to, we realize 
that in some situations, this is not going to get us where we want to be. Sometimes we said there might be a knowledge gap, but sometimes it's resistance. It's a sign. And simply rolling with this resistance is often the best course. Because if there's ambivalence present, they feel two ways about something, or there's reasons to change and reasons not to change, and we give arguments on the side of change, they often give the other side of that argument. And when they're in this place arguing against change, it's not the place where change will be successful. The more participants verbalize disadvantages of change, the more committed they are to staying the same or sustaining that status quo. We can remind ourselves that it's not our job or our responsibility to try to convince anyone to change. They're responsible for their own change or lack of change. And one way we can do this is just simply reflect people's resistance. Reflect their point of view, respect it, listen, and move on. So let's focus on how to share information when we do feel it's appropriate or it is warranted. It could be sharing a concern or sharing information when you feel they don't have that information and they really need it. So here are some strategies that we'll talk about when sharing information, holding education, using questions to tailor information, using curiosity, normalizing, asking permission, and providing recommendations. You'll notice that some of these, like normalizing and asking permission, they're the same skills we use during the assessment process, but we just use them slightly differently when we're sharing information. The first suggestion, holding education. One person on the survey put it this way. Wait until the very end to offer any recommendations or suggestions for improvement. We want the client to feel comfortable talking or opening up, and they won't if every time they say something, we butt in with facts and guidelines. So separating the information from the assessment process, it will reduce that feeling of being judged. You might share an educational pamphlet later with them with some information in it. You could share the information in a neutral way. Or you might frame it as a small shift later in the session. Everything looks great. It sounds like you're doing really well. The only area I could see and make a recommendation might be putting cereal in the bottle. Most pediatricians are now suggesting that cereal or any solids be fed with a spoon. Would you be interested in hearing more about the new recommendations? On the survey, we asked, when you want to address a particular risk or concern that the parent has not noted as an issue, how do you approach it effectively to minimize that resistance? And one popular theme in the responses was using open-ended questions. Open questions help us find out things to tailor the information. We can learn what they need to know, what they want to know, what they know already. We can learn where their motivation might be. And the one thing we don't have to do is we don't have to try to convince them to change their minds. That's one thing we don't have to do. But many of you said questions help you determine the best information to share. So here are some responses. Asking if they're interested in getting information or suggestions about a specific topic. Use open-ended questions to keep the client at the center of the conversation. Let the client solve the issue while I act as a guide in the conversation. I ask them, how do you feel about or what are some questions or concerns you might have regarding this topic? What, if anything, do you have interest in changing? When do you think it's the best time to wean from the bottle or introduce solid foods? What have you heard about vitamin D? So finding out what they already know will help tailor the information and collect any misinformation. So asking, what have you heard about? I usually ask, what do you know about this particular topic? They might not be educated, and that's why they're not concerned. Or if they are educated, then explore how they came to the decision to not change the behavior. Asking how they feel about the behavior overall. Asking what they've heard from outside sources, like family members, friends, medical provider. Asking what they've tried to do to remedy a situation. 
So what they've heard or what they've tried, depending on the situation. Using our curiosity to help engage parents in a discussion, it's less directive and it's more participatory. It's a great way to explore a topic. Here are some responses from the survey around curiosity. I choose my words carefully. I praise the topics with, I wonder, or tell me why you. I want to be careful that they don't feel I'm judging what they're doing. Put the emphasis on other parents or professionals, such as, some parents have told me that giving water instead of juice between meals helps improve the appetite at meals. Do you think that juice could be affecting your child's appetite? So you're sharing a potential theory for the low appetite, and then you're asking them. They're the expert on their own child. What do you think? It's a sign of autonomy. It's a sign of respect. Normalizing. We talk about normalizing in the assessment phase. And normalizing can also be a great way to bring up a topic that you want to discuss. So you're framing the information as something that other parents have asked about or other parents have shown interest in and asking if they're interested as well. So you're framing it as something you see often. You're normalizing it. So here are some comments from the survey around normalizing. And they ask if they have any nutrition-related topics to discuss for their child's age group. If they have nothing to bring up, I'll say, many parents ask about whatever the topic is. What do you think? Sometimes I come across parents who are concerned about the topic at this age. How do you feel about that with your child? Something parents wonder about at this age is how to wean from the bottle. Can I share some strategies? Or sometimes milk intake can be related to low iron. Would you like to know more about that? State that many people struggle with similar issues. Ask if it's okay to discuss some solutions that have worked for others. Ask if they'd like to discuss the topic. So normalizing is such an effective strategy when dealing with sensitive topics. Again, asking permission is a great way to emphasize autonomy when sharing unsolicited information or strategies when they haven't asked. So here are some responses from the survey. Ask if I can share a possible concern. Ask if I can discuss something I see about the child. Mention that WIC is a health screening program and we try to help parents give their kids the healthiest start possible. Ask permission to problem solve with them. Ask for permission to offer some suggestions, praise something they're doing well, then offer the AAP guidelines on whatever the topic is, contrast to what the parent has stated about their family, and ask how they feel about that if they feel like there's any changes that could be made. You can use asking permission and using curiosity together. Maybe, for example, it's a parent who is giving excessive juice because they believe that that's healthy. Maybe you say something like, can I share with you something I've learned about juice? You said that you feel she's a little heavier than other girls her age. You're correct that juice can be healthy, but it can also be a source of calories that could lead to extra weight gain. You're the one that knows her best. Do you think that the extra juice could be a factor causing her to be a little heavier than other girls her age? Using that curiosity. Some thoughts from the survey around providing a recommendation you feel the participant should have. Stay objective as possible. Explain why the concern is important to address. Provide information in a non-judgmental way. I'll say most doctors recommend, or according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, or dentists and doctors are now recommending. Ask if they received info, uh, information about it. Ask permission. Ask for feedback. So it's that whole cycle. Ask what they've heard. Ask permission to share. Share, and then check back in or ask for feedback. I'd like to do another poll question here. When we asked about challenging situations, there were a couple around the same topic. So when a parent is proud of a feeding practice with their child, such as early introduction of solids. When a parent is proud of a practice of CPA sees as unhealthy. So let's pretend that a participant comes in and their three-month-old is already taking solids and they're proud about it. 
So how can we provide information without offending that parent? I'll switch to the poll. I'll read some possible responses, and you can vote for your favorite or add a different one. So how would you respond to that? So some possible responses, I'll read them first, could be, many parents ask about starting solid foods. Can I share with you the suggested guidelines around introducing solids? Or later in the session, you could say, can I share with you some information around introducing foods? And after they agree, in this pamphlet are guidelines or suggestions for starting solids. They recommend starting solids with a spoon. They now recommend holding solids until closer to six months old as they're learning more about baby's digestion and developmental signs that the baby's ready for solid foods. This might be something you want to talk about with your doctor to see what's right for you and your baby. Or, it seems like she's doing well. I'd like to share one potential concern I might have if that's okay with you. And after she agrees, WIC now recommends waiting a bit longer for starting foods other than breast milk or formula. Would you be interested in hearing about the latest guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics about when to start solids and the types of foods to start with or other? Maybe you have something else. So feel free to vote now or type something in that chat box. Go ahead and broadcast these because it looks like as the votes are coming in, we have a tie going on that the, the their votes are spread across the different responses. So what I'll do is when I send this, the survey, the post survey for this webinar, I'll include these polls so that if any of these resonate with you, you can try them out with your participants. How about back to Sharon? So there might be times when you want to express a different viewpoint than the participant. It's not always necessary because this appointment is about how they feel, not necessarily how you feel, but sometimes you might want to. For example, someone might be telling you about this great diet that they're going to go on that is wonderful and they only eat kale and leeks all day long, and that's the diet. In this case, you might want to express a different viewpoint. It's possible. You might not change the person's course of action, but you could influence them. So some things to think about when you do want to express a different viewpoint. One is to actively listen to their viewpoint. It shows respect. Ask questions. Asking questions shows you're willing to learn and get informed. And this will demonstrate that you're tolerant and open to other ideas. Although you might not agree with their perspective, you can still support their ability to express themselves, to hold their own individual beliefs. You're supporting the fact that their choices are theirs to make. So you could share a different viewpoint. You might say, there's a range of opinions on effective ways to lose weight. You're going to decide what's right for you and your body. Could I share with you my perspective on weight loss and dieting? And share your perspective if it's done in a respectful way. Several people mentioned vaccines as a potential sensitive topic on the survey. Lately, there's been a rising number of parents that don't want to immunize their children for fear of adverse reactions. And there's still that prevalent misconception around the MMR vaccine and autism. There's also concerns about the amount of immunizations children receive now. And how you communicate about vaccines and the information that you do share will depend on their reaction when you ask the questions about vaccines. Now, if they're firmly against vaccines, arguing against them or negating their beliefs will most likely not work. This can actually backfire and make the participants defend their point of view more firmly. Instead, you could choose to demonstrate respect for their autonomy. Some people will just choose not to immunize. It will always be the case at WIC. It's their right and it's their responsibility as well. If, however, someone asks a question, they have doubt, they ask for your opinion, then you can share your opinion or WIC's position on vaccines. They could say something like, immunizations cause sickness, right? Or they might say, I've heard some negative things about vaccines, I'm not sure. They're asking about 
You can ask about what they've heard about vaccines, and you can respond. One tip in a response about vaccine is make it direct, short, and strong. You could say, yes, some people have feel that way. Can I share Wix recommendation? If they agree, say, Wix supports the current childhood immunization schedule, along with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization. The U.S. has seen a significant rise in the number of cases of vaccine-preventable diseases, like measles and whooping cough. Adverse reactions to immunizations, they're very rare. Dangers of vaccine-preventable diseases are many times greater than the risks of serious adverse reactions to those vaccines. So just sharing your opinion. Or maybe they're asking about that MMR. Maybe they ask, are those claims about autism and other diseases real? And you could just answer them directly. You could say something like, the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. It's been studied extensively. Research has proven that vaccines aren't linked to chronic diseases like autism, multiple sclerosis, asthma, sudden infant death syndrome. Immunizations prevent disease. And in communities where immunization rates go down, immunization preventable diseases go up. And unimmunized children are at significantly higher risk of developing a vaccine preventable disease than immunized children. So it depends whether they ask a question, how they feel. With parents who've chosen not to immunize or leaning that way, you can simply affirm their common goals, their res respect that motivation. Their goal is really to protect their child and keep them healthy. That's the goal of what they're doing. And you can respect that and respect that goal because that's our goal too. That's what we want as well. When discussing vaccines, you could offer statistics or research. I used to work with a doctor who called them sticky facts. Quick facts or percentages that you can do that influence people and that will stick with them. An example of a sticky fact around vaccines could be Unvaccinated children are 23 times more likely to get whooping cough compared to fully immunized children. Just a little fact to throw out. You always want to reinforce that autonomy. Parents are going to make the best decisions for their child, and you can reinforce that. If they do have questions, you can offer more information. You can offer a handout or a website for them. You can recommend they discuss it with their doctor. Parents rate their children's doctor as the most trusted source for vaccine safety information. I'd like to do another poll question on vaccines. So say someone comes into your office and they share, I'm thinking about not getting any more vaccines. I'm worried about the connection with autism. I've heard some scary things lately. So you hear some doubt in her voice. So I'll read some possible responses, and then we can vote. So how would you respond to that? You could say, the decision to vaccinate your child can be complex and difficult. Which does recommend vaccines as the best way to keep your child healthy? If you're concerned about the safety of vaccines or any possible connection to autism, talk to your doctor. Or if you'd like, I could provide you with some information. Or Autism is a burden for many families, and people want answers, including me. Can I share with you what I've learned from my research into that connection? And after they give consent, well-designed studies have been done to show that MMR vaccine is not, is not the cause of autism. It might be something you want to discuss with your doctor before you make a decision. Or it's up to you to make the best choice for your child. It sounds like you're giving it some serious thought and getting all the facts before you make a decision. That's really a smart choice. If you want more information about vaccines and their safety, let me know I have some information you can take home. Or maybe there's another response. So go ahead and vote now. Or feel free to write anything in the chat box. I'll give a minute for the votes to come in. It looks like so far we have two popular responses. It looks like the first one is pulling ahead a little bit. The decision to vaccinate your child can be complex and difficult. What does recommend vaccines is the best way to keep your child healthy. If you are concerned about the safety of vaccines or any possible connection to autism, 
talk to your doctor if you'd like. I can provide you with some information. I'll go back to sharing now. During this webinar, we shared a lot of great ideas for handling sensitive topics in counseling. So how to ask about sensitive topics and how to share information effectively. And I want to take a pause now. Pause here and ask if anyone has a question or if they'd like to share a strategy, share an idea. If you'd like to do it over the phone, you can just come off mute and share with the group. You don't have to raise your hand. Or you can type directly into that chat box on the left. Either way, I'll pause for a moment here to see if anyone would like to add something. And we'll leave that chat box open for people for a couple minutes after the webinar. If people want to share their ideas, strategies, how they open conversations around sensitive topics, you can feel free to type right into that chat box. So I want to thank you for all your great ideas around approaching sensitive topics in the survey. There was a lot of great suggestions. And sharing best practices with each other and our ideas is how we grow in our work and how we develop our own individual styles. So I'll end here. And thank you for joining us today on this webinar. I hope you have a great day. And feel free to type in that chat box if you'd like. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.